just as Kirk just said, I'd like to welcome everyone here to our DBNCR IPD Big Room and Social in a World of Social Distancing panel discussion. Uh, and I'll first start off with introductions of the presenters. And I'll start with Antonio Balhosa, uh, BIM Application Specialist at American Company. Antonio is an instructor at Algonquin College in the BIM Lifecycle Management Program and has more than a decade of work experience in the design sector as an architectural technologist and in recent years as a design application specialist for American Company. With experience in the corporate office, commercial, public, and institutional sectors, he has worked on projects at various scales from small homes to the rehabilitation of the parliamentary buildings of Canada. Antonio, uh, could I get a little bit, uh, could you please expand on that? Um, so um, when I first started in the industry, uh, and I tell this story to most of my students, uh, I applied for a job that I didn't, I wasn't qualified for which was, it's always a great story as an encouragement for people who are looking to get their foot in the door. So um, I got a job as a student um, uh, before graduating, a year before graduating from uh, at HOK here in Ottawa. Uh, and I was going to school in Toronto and they wanted someone with a minimum of college degree, two to four years experience. And I was like, well, I'm taking a year off and uh, I'm only looking work uh, work for a year. And it worked out really well for them because it was, uh, they had someone on uh, uh, paternal leave. So it just really worked out for them. And that really opened up my door into, um, after graduation, I got a job at Turner Fleischer and, and I started working on like commercial facilities, uh, distribution facilities all across Canada. So I went from, uh, my first project was the TELUS headquarters uh, here in Ottawa on Bank Street. And uh, then went from that to a very fast paced commercial uh, firm such as Turner Fleischer in their department. So I went from cor uh, corporate offices to distribution centers for Loblaws all across Canada, literally from coast to coast. I've worked on projects from British Columbia all the way to St. John's, Newfoundland, but I never visited them. <laughs> I only worked on them on paper. <laughs> and then um, after working there for a couple of years, I came back to Ottawa and I got my, basically my old job back here at, uh, at HOK. And yeah, that, that was just uh, a whirlwind of a lot of project exposure. And uh, uh, in recent, in the latter years of working at HOK, they, they got the bid for the rehabilitation project for Parliament of Canada. And I started with uh, basically the digital team from there. So working with A49 and HOK, uh, being like the um, technology leads on that project. And that really opened up my eyes to uh, a broader world of tools and technology that are available there. And uh, collaboration tools and even communication tools. Like uh, I had seven different apps on my laptop, depending on which partners I was communicating with just because like levels of security and circles. And uh, yeah, now I'm at uh, Merrick and I uh, couldn't be happier. It's been uh, uh, a roller coaster of, of experience. So it's been pretty awesome. Right. Uh, just quickly, so could could you tell everyone on the panel uh, what what's your role at Merrick and what what Merrick does? All right. So my role at Merrick is that I got brought in as their only Canadian design technology applicant, like application specialist, and because I've got a um, a good solid base of understanding, um, you know design methodologies, working with the software, understanding how packages and production is done. I hold a lot of resources in that. So uh, my main task is uh, make, helping people get their work done. I, I consider myself more of a Sherpa. I just guide people up the mountain because I've been up the mountain up and down so many times, but I'm, I'm not the one who's going to be actually, you know, climbing that mountain of work that they got to do. So um, aside from uh, setting out frameworks on how projects are going to be delivered and how we're going to be uh, getting them done, done, it's identifying, um, uh, you know, potential for training for uh, individuals or for offices abroad or even as um, an organization ac uh, across the entire organization. So I've got a team of four. So it's me and uh, my boss and uh, three other people that we all share the same title. And uh, yeah, we, we look at the design technology side and we're, we're you know, partnered up with IT because of just the, uh, the nature of the business. Great. 
Thank you, Antonio. Uh, next is Lindsay Wharton, IPD and Continuous Improvement Coach at Chandos Construction. Lindsay Wharton is an IPD coach at Chandos Construction with 18 years of experience in the design and construction industry. She works across Canada to provide virtual and in-person facilitation, training and coaching to collaborative design and construction project teams. This helps individuals and teams maximize their potential in areas of communication, problem solving, decision making, and collaboration while leveraging lean tools and processes. Prior to joining Chandos, Lindsay's works, um, sorry, Lindsay worked for the city of Barrie as manager of facility planning and development, where she led several major capital initiatives to support growth in the city. Most notably, she led the $100 million integrated project delivery of the Barrie Simcoe Emergency Services Campus. Prior to that, Lindsay worked for the town of Newmarket, and even further back, she started out the first part of her career as an architectural technologist, supporting the design of civic and K-12 education projects. Uh, Lindsay, please tell us about Chandos and, uh, and your role there. Thanks, Omar. Um, my role, I really think of as connecting people and, you know, kind of helping them work better together. And I'm really fortunate that I get to work across Canada. I don't kind of have a specific geographic location. I work to support all of our IPD or integrated project delivery projects and, you know, help in all sorts of different scenarios from kind of the very first kickoff of a project we do to kind of individual or team coaching and training along the way. And sometimes find myself there to help with complex problems that teams might have just to help them sort through or kind of navigate those situations. On a more personal level, I just also wanted to share, I'm not sure if you can see, but that's our puppy, Gary, <laughs> just so everybody gets a little snapshot, because in times of a pandemic, you know, everyone needs a COVID puppy. <laughs> the boys named him Gary after Gary the Snail from Spongebob, just a small personal Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, and I've worked um, alongside everyone here on the panel and have really enjoyed getting to know these people, so I'm really excited for our talk today. Fantastic. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, next on the list is Mike Good, project manager at McMaster Innovation Park. With over 20 years of experience in the construction in engineering industries, Mike brings expertise as a project manager at a key growth period for the park, having experienced projects in various roles, including from the architects, engineers, contractors, and owner's side of a project. He has a breadth of understanding of the requirements for a successful project. Mike has worked with worldwide companies like Coca-Cola to small engineering firms on projects ranging from wastewater, process, greenfield, brownfield, industrial, commercial, pharmaceutical, and residential. With a passion for efficiency and a teamwork mentality, Mike sees, seeks to keep projects on time, on budget, and on point with the integrated project teams that he becomes a part of. Mike, please tell us more about uh, McMaster Innovation Park and what you do there. So McMaster Innovation Park, um, I think the best way to describe it uh, would be exactly how our CEO describes it. Um, it it's similar to the uh, phil philosophical thought experiment. Uh, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a noise? Well, if an inventor or an innovator comes up with a brilliant idea, but nobody hears about it, was it actually a brilliant idea? Our job is to kind of bridge that uh, bridge that gap between research and industry. Um, we're we're helping companies grow by uh, by providing them space to grow in, as well as um, again another phrase that uh, our CEO coined: uh, spatial alchemy. Uh, basically, allowing for those natural collisions between people to occur and. Uh, uh, that's that's really where innovation lives and thrives is when you get two people that are really working on completely different projects that end up finding some kind of common ground and it kind of brings those projects together. Um, so as as you had mentioned, right now is a, a pretty major growth period for uh, for McMaster Innovation Park. Um, we currently have uh, 58 acres and 700,000 square feet of space, um, and we're in the middle of a basically a quantum expansion where at full build out, we're going to be at, at about 200, uh, 2.5 million square feet of space. 
Um, it's going to include everything from office space, hotel, legal offices, residential green space, amenities, um, right through to um, something that McMaster University has recently announced, uh, the Global Nexus for Pandemics and Biological Threats, um, what we've coined the, uh, the Pandemic Center. Um, so really, it's it's all about us trying to provide space and uh, and the ability for smaller companies to grow, medium companies to grow bigger, and major companies to be able to anchor the park. So it's uh, it's an exciting time, and uh, I, I right now I'm actually in the process of uh, working on one of those expansion projects with uh, with Justin and Lindsay. And it's it's introduced me to this whole world of uh, IPD and it's it's a great world to be in. Fantastic. Um, just as an aside, so all that all that square footage you have right now is it's enough for five people? Uh, no, there's, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, we've got quite a few people in there, um, including, uh, you know, NRCAN, um, you know, the, the mat lab that, uh, that they're occupying, uh, McMaster University has the Mark building where, uh, there's major, um, automotive research going on. So, you know, there's, uh, material testing and uh, and innovation, automotive testing and innovation. We've got uh, biological suites that uh, that there's plenty of experiments going on in. So it, it really ranges, uh, which is exciting for me because I can get bored easily, and it doesn't look like there's going to be any possibility of getting bored in this park. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you, Mike. Uh, so last but certainly not least is Justin Perdue, uh, Perdue, a principal at HDR Architects. Justin is a registered architect and principal with HDR. Over the past 15 years, he has focused his career on higher education and institutional projects with an emphasis on design excellence. A firm believer that change is the only constant, he was an early adopter of BIM and sought out opportunities to design in a more collaborative and efficient way, which led him to lean design and construction and integrated project delivery. Justin, please tell us about uh, tell us about your work and what you do. Awesome. Well, that was that was a pretty great uh, introduction. It covered off pretty much all the things I wanted to say. But yes, um, I've really focused my career on uh, science, technology, education type projects, um, and that I, I just find that really rewarding because I think that in uh, creating buildings for researchers and educators. Um, we're kind of supporting the great work that they're doing. And that that personally makes me feel really good uh, about what I do. Um, I started my career actually in a very technical role. Um, I was a, a 3D modeler and renderer. And so uh, I've kind of seen, and now I, I lead projects. So I've, I've kind of seen the the whole gambit of, of de, you know, designing and delivering projects. And I used to be the guy who was mad at the principal because I didn't have enough time to do the renderings at the end of the project. And now I'm that guy. Although I try to be nicer and, and leave more time uh, for the renderings. Also, the, the technology has improved dramatically. Um, I'm really excited actually to be here today because collaborative design and construction is something I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm going to throw the first hot take of the day out there in my intro, which is that the traditional way of designing and uh, constructing buildings is fundamentally flawed and broken. And I'm, I'm just really excited uh, for IPD and I'm excited to talk to you guys about what it is and uh, also how we've kind of adapted uh, in these changing times. So thank you. Fantastic, Justin. Uh, actually, the, um... I'd like to direct the first question to you and then open it up to the rest of the panel. So could you, could you set the stage and, and tell us before the year that shall not be named, what was IPD like? Well, I, I think one of the, I guess, you know, to come back to the title uh, of, of this, of this, uh, of this talk, you know, IPD was this highly collaborative process, but it was really based around this mechanism of the big room. Right? So it was this idea that instead of everybody working independently and with their own sort of motivations, we would come together you know, once a week for a day or two days or three days uh, in one physical space, and we would have this in incredible collaboration. And I saw that work. I did that with Lindsay and with Tony as well. 
And it really is quite powerful. Everyone being in one space, talking about the project, being immersed in it, getting a real sense of what your partners are doing. I, I, have a, I came away with a much greater sense of an understanding of what a lot of the engineering disciplines do. So that, that big room and that physical collaboration uh, was, was a huge component of IPD. And I can recall back at the beginning of uh, this pandemic time being very concerned about what that would mean for IPD when we could no longer uh, meet in those big rooms uh, and, and have that collaboration. Great. Um, would the rest of the panel like to add? Well, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. So um, the current project that I'm working on is my first uh, true IPD uh, project delivery experience. And um, I started on the project um, you know, with Justin and Lindsay uh, before the event that we shall not name. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, what I noticed that, you know, uh, from a traditional experienced work environment to uh, what IPD uh, kind of delivers is that um, the pace of the work, it just seemed to be a lot faster, right? Because you're, you're, you're concentrated, you're focused on an and everyone's focused on a similar task at hand. So um, what I was seeing in terms of the production and the output was a better quality, a better coordinated document. And it, it just, there was a lot more engagement. It just felt like there was a lot more decisions were actually being uh, discussed and made in quicker time. So th that was what I was taking out of I IPD that. Um, and when we transitioned to being all virtual, uh, at first, um, it, it wasn't lost, but I did find that the pace uh, was a lot faster. Like there was, there seemed to be more meetings to be had just because of the uh, availability of technology. You, you know, it was easier just to grab someone into a meeting. So, yeah. Uh, so, Mike, actually, uh, you mentioned when you were talking about the innovation park how you know you, you have you have the interactivity and you have the the cross pollination of ideas and and whatnot. Um, so this is something that uh, we previously discussed, which was the, the, you know, the non-structured interactions that happen in IPD big rooms. And could you, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, like it, it's, it's interesting. It's this, uh, you know, just like Antonio, this is my first kind of official IPD project. And I've always, I've always been all about integration and any project that I always worked on, I always tried to get that cross, that cross pollination of, of the different disciplines working together. Um, I always made sure that it was, it was kind of a, a group effort um, as we were going into the design phases and making sure that everybody was a part of those, uh, of those conversations. And having not unfortunately having not gone through the physical big room uh, my only experience so far has been with the the, the virtual big room and it, it's it's been incredible um, the the amount of work and the quality of work like Antonio was saying it, it's it, it's phenomenal um, actually having, different disciplines looking at other disciplines and making suggestions uh, on different ideas it, it's that's that's again where where innovation lives and you know it may not be the greatest idea but it may spark you know if mechanical is talking to structural saying hey what if you were to do this it may not be a a, a perfect recommendation but it may get the structural engineer thinking, hey, you know what, that won't work, but this could. And that's that's really where, that's re to me, that's where the integration and the innovation lives in IPD projects. It's, it, it's amazing to actually get to watch day in and day out. Fantastic. Uh, Lindsay, so this, this leads to the next question. So Mike mentioned, you know, dealing with virtual big rooms. Um, could, could you tell us, you know, what was the, what was the digital state of IPD big rooms, both before in the transition and, and now? Sure. Thanks, Omar. So I was just, as I was listening to my colleagues, I was just kind of trying to wrap off in my head um, what the split is of kind of in-person versus maybe a hybrid and then fully digital big rooms that I've been a part of. So looking at 
you know, approximately 10, there might be plus or minus, there might be upwards of 12 big rooms now to the point that I've been an active member in and three of them were only in person. So I kind of have, I think a, a decent experience over a couple of years of seeing what that looked like. And to describe it, I would say um, the energy is palpable when you get into a space like that. And it is highly productive when, you know, the conversation is flowing, people are learning and growing constantly in that environment and connecting with one another in ways that are challenging in a virtual environment. So there's, those are kind of some of the advantages that I saw. We, as a company, we, um, we kind of let everyone know who's starting on their first IPD journey that technology is absolutely kind of a, a fundamental part of keeping IPD working. So we always did kind of introduce communication channels that would keep everyone connected outside of the big room like Yammer or Slack. Um, so those things were highly used beforehand. And same with BIM, um, you know, using BIM 360 for everyone to have access and kind of, you know, stay on the same page when it came to those iterative processes with design. And in the field, just to connect back, we also had lots of tools to keep um, connected to, to what was happening with the work. Um, but now we've taken some of what we would term analog tools or kind of, you know, those paper-based tangible things we would put up on the big room wall. And in March, we really quickly had to adapt and create digital versions. And I would still say we're, we're working on improving those every day. And it's because of our teams and their drive for, you know, working for the projects they're on and wanting to do best for those that we've actually leaned heavily on, on our teams to help develop those tools. But I would say by about April of this past year, we had many of them kind of fully transitioned from in-person or analog to, to kind of digital tools we could use. And that was really cool to see. Um, I just quickly wanted to comment, I'm gonna steal this from one of my clients, our Kamloops. His name is Matt Cashel from the city of Kamloops. Yeah, he would take a phone call from anyone who was curious about IPD and wanted to learn a bit more, but just this week, they closed out their project. We started in person last year. And then when March hit, you know, they were in kind of starting in design phase and he was a bit overwhelmed. But um, they are um, kind of such a marker for success in transitioning from that in person to, to digital world. And he's left me with some really cool reflections, which is that kind of normal traditional doctrine of project management would tell you, you kind of have to pick one constraint as a priority, right? It's either schedule, budget, or quality. And in this case, he said, you know, I honestly did not notice a marked difference between how the team delivered the work. They were still motivated to work for the project and we were able to achieve quality and budget and schedule. So, which is kind of a, a cool takeaway. Awesome. Um... So digital solutions. So you mentioned, you know, there's been a transition to from IPD big rooms to virtual. Uh, there, was, there was a mention before this recording started that, uh, you know, of a poll plan. And, and there was a software tool called Miro. So uh, Justin, would, would you like to talk about that? Sure. So maybe, maybe the first thing I should do is kind of explain what a poll plan is for, for everyone. Um, so, so poll planning comes from lean design and construction. And if you think about the traditional way of putting together a schedule, you're essentially uh, lining up a series of activities or deliverables, right? So you say like, first we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, and then eventually you get your, your final deliverable. Uh, and often that's done by like a person or a small group of people, and the rest of the team just sort of has to deal with the, the consequences of their decisions. Um, with lean design and construction, you use a process called poll planning or the last planner system. And how that works is actually the reverse. So you start with your final deliverable, which I guess in our industry is uh, the building is occupiable. And you sort of say, okay, well, what's the, what's the thing that has, this is the last thing that has to happen before that. Okay, how long will it take from between those two? Then you back it up again. You say, okay, what's the last thing that has to happen before that milestone? And you keep kind of backing that up and you're doing it as a group. So you're doing it uh, with the owner, you're doing it with the architect, you're doing it with the consulting engineers, um, furniture suppliers, uh, contractors, you name it. And everyone is helping build out this schedule. And what makes it different is that people are making commitments to meet those individual deadlines in front of the whole team. 
And so there's a real sense of ownership. Um, when you say you can do something in three weeks, uh, no one told you you were going to do it in three weeks. You promised. Uh, and so the, 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 the kind of the weight on you to deliver on that is, is higher. And so it, it leads to more accurate schedules and it leads to greater buy-in on those schedules. So hopefully that's explained uh, pull planning a little bit. Now, how that was done in a, a physical big room traditionally was you would essentially take over an entire wall of the big room and you would put up this kind of calendar grid and there'd be a bunch of sticky notes with all these different tasks um, for different people. Obviously, we can't do that anymore. Um, and so once that occurred, there was a bit of a scramble because the pull plan is absolutely critical to lean design and construction. And lots of different uh, softwares were played with, but one that we found that's quite successful, and we used it on the, the MIP project uh, with Mike, uh, is called Miro, uh, M-I-R-O. And again, like we're not like shilling for Miro. There's lots of programs that can do this stuff, but it's what we've used and we found it to be really effective. And essentially, it's a digital whiteboard that many people can uh, look at at the same time. And so you can do that. You basically make a a digital analog of that physical wall. And you put these little digital stickies uh, on the schedule. And I'll just say from my own experience, you know, we were concerned about this transition from physical to digital. I'm not sure I'd go back. I think that the digital pull plan actually is more effective than the physical pull plan, at least for, at least in the design phase, certainly. Because everyone can actually be in that digital space simultaneously, you can be kind of zooming into the piece that, that you want to focus on. But the key thing is, and you're kind of seeing this right now, in a digital environment, oh, there you go, there's an example of it, fantastic. Um, only one person can talk at a time. So in a traditional big room, people would kind of break off into little groups, and you're supposed to collaborate with the other groups in the room, but sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't happen, and things can get up on the wall that maybe other people aren't aware of. But when you develop a plan like this in a digital medium, everyone hears what everyone else is thinking. And so you hear the electrical engineer saying, I, it's critical to me in order for me to complete my work, I need this thing from the architecture group on this day. And then as an architect, I can think, okay, that's really hard, but maybe if I reshape how I do my work, I can actually meet that deliverable. And that's when you start to see the real gains. It's when people stop doing things the way they've always done it and try to do things the way that's most effective for the project. So It ends up being about information rather than your kind of conventional process you might have followed. It's about what information can I share with others to help them advance their work and for me to advance mine, right, and add value. Um, I just pulled that up as a while you were talking, Dustin, I hope that's okay for everyone in the in the audience. I hope you can see, but this is a really intuitive tool we've found has really helped, especially in the early phase of validation or kind of pre-design and and design phase. Um, and this is showing uh, McMaster's uh, example right there. So uh, Mike Good is actually in there. You can kind of see him floating around. It's a very cool process, and we have found it to be one of the more effective tools. We've tried many. I just um, also want to flag that poll planning has sincerely been the most challenging tool to transition from in-person to digital, just because of those exchanges that you could have in person with communication. There's small kind of nuanced things that you couldn't quite read with each other um, in, a, in a virtual world. But Miro, we've found in those early phase um, conversations that it really is the most effective. And then I quickly just behind it wanted to share with you in the field in case you were wondering what it can look like in construction. Shandos uses last planner system on every construction site, regardless of the contract model. It, it doesn't, it's not just for IPD, but it's for every job we have. It's just our preferred way of planning and, and delivering on our promises. And this is just a distanced pull plan um, in the field where we've set up what would normally be kind of our analog version of, of the system outside for everyone to join. And there are digital versions of this where you can use kind of a smart board, um, but you kind of, you have to choose the most appropriate tool that's cost effective as well for, for every project you've got. Yeah, I would, I would jump in and say with my experience with lean construction, um, you know, when, when you have your meeting and everyone's put their post-its in for the day, um, someone has to document that. So either they, you know, they would go into a system like Miro to, to, to manually copy it over to a digital system for record keeping, or they'd end up taking pictures and distributing that as 
quote unquote meeting minutes. So having it digital first, uh, and, and not only that, but in a collaborative medium is, is, you know, as Justin said, is probably the future. And it, like to, to the point of lean construction, it's, it's exactly that. It, it is much leaner than having to take what everybody just talked about and reiterate it. Now or, it's all been done at one time. Yeah, or as as I've seen happen, you know, you have you have one of the assistant superintendents scratch his head, put together a schedule, have a meeting saying this is the schedule, have arguments saying I can't meet those dates, and then nothing gets changed on the schedule that isn't even applicable. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and we have Excel versions and PDF versions as well, but Miro just seems to be kind of a really cool intuitive tool that's easy for everybody to use and access yeah and 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 like when you're actually doing the pull planning in the big room um like was discussed like uh, justin was discussing before like the the trickiness of virtual uh virtual big rooms and even virtual meetings like this is only one person can talk at a time otherwise it just becomes a garbled mess so you know like one person is talking, they're talking through their portion of the poll plan. And like Justin said, you're actually getting to hear how they're thinking through it. And that gets you thinking about your por your portion and how their portion is affecting your portion. And it's it, it may take a little bit longer while doing it, but the savings is, as we discussed, in the end when you don't have to reiterate it. Fantastic. Actually, I'll, I'll probably come back to that uh, later on in my, my big list of questions for this for this panel. Um, actually, actually oh, that actually leads into the next question very nicely, Mike. Uh, participation. So you're saying, you know, you're, you're in a meeting, only one person can talk at one time. Um, whereas the idea of a big room is potentially to have, you know, side conversations when another conversation is happening to try and gain efficiencies where you know you can have cross-pollination uh so how how do you how, how do you get that participation uh, like do you have any ideas any tricks i i think i think one of the key things is right from the beginning it, the big room has to become a safe place a place where people feel comfortable to share their thoughts, to share their feelings, to share their ideas um, without, without judgment. Um, one, once you have that, that kind of set up, the, all of the communication just starts becoming a lot more natural. Um, well, as natural as it can in a virtual environment. Um, one one other way that I have actually seen during our meetings of kind of those side conversations going on is in the chat. Um, you know, there while somebody's talking, like if I'm talking and Lindsay wants to say something to Justin, she could just type it out in the chat and, you know, specifically do at Justin and he knows he knows that he needs to respond to that. I um, often heckle him in the chat. <laughs> Actually, I think you you're doing that right now in this chat, right? <laughs> it's it's almost bullying. I don't know what's going on. Uh. <laughs> so much for that safe space. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it, it like really, if the key is to make sure that everybody is is contributing, um, and on top of that, in terms of efficiency, you want to make sure that you have the right people in the room at the right time and making sure that everybody that is in the room at that time is actually adding value to the project. Um, so continuing along that, that idea of lean, lean construction and lean design, um, the way that we found it best is we had a shared calendar through SharePoint um, where, you know, if, somebody, a specialist like our, uh, like our sustainability, uh, HDR sustainability specialist, he costs a lot of money per hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to make sure as the owner that we're tapping into that resource kind of 
as needed and we don't have him just kind of sitting around for an entire day on the, on the virtual meeting not necessarily needing to be there or not necessarily being able to contribute so you know we we would set up like office hours from i, th I think it was thursday like two two o'clock until four o'clock and from the, in that pocket of time we knew for a fact that that specialist was going to be on so we set that time aside specifically for sustainability and we did that for, for various other uh, for various other things as well. And what that ended up doing is it really brought it, it really lined up the efficiency and kept everybody on point. It, we 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 managed to uh, for the most part keep our uh, keep our meetings and our big rooms um, aligned with the schedule that uh, that had be, had been created. Um, and I, I, I believe he's still on here, but uh, a shout out to uh, Shafraz from uh, Eco Ammo. Um, he's our uh, he's our IPD facilitator that MIP brought on board to um, to to help us with that. So uh, uh, a shout out to uh, a shout out to Shafraz and Eco Ammo for uh, for all the support that they've provided during. I have one more quick shout out for them. Um, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in virtual uh, big room facilitation is starting everybody um, by building habits together. And one of the habits is actually with an icebreaker. I know it pained some of the people who wanted to jump right into work, but it makes the conversation more effective. So it's not just about that efficiency that Mike appreciates. And, you know, it's completely warranted, especially as an owner, when, you know, you are paying for everyone's time. You want to make sure it's efficient, but the effectiveness that came behind building that habit of just having a quick moment to connect every morning. We had a big room. It was so invaluable. And yeah, anybody, I guess, who knows me knows that I'm a big fan. And I think it's a big part of building culture is to keep reserve and reserve time for, for connecting as people. Right. And to add, to add on to that, um, like, in a virtual big room, you don't get that interconnectedness that you do with uh, with a natural big room. Uh, you don't have you don't get to read the body language. You don't get to have those social interactions that you typically do. So this is where you kind of bring a little piece of your personal life into the conversation, and. Uh, the the key word that Lindsay used was culture. You start building that culture within your virtual big room, and it's through that that you get to that having that safe place in the big room where you're actually comfortable to to share your thoughts and your feelings. So, so speaking of feelings, Antonio, I wanna I wanna pull you into this. Uh, sure. I, I would it was one of you know you know would you, would you be okay with me saying you're one of the boots on the ground you're you're one of the guys who, who's getting the asks and and the workload and and I, I want to ask you I'm definitely a gear in the machine that's for sure <laughs> uh, so I want I want to ask you so how's how's the shift to this whole virtual thing and you know Mike's talking about you you can block certain you know potentially expensive people yeah. or, or, you know, difficult to get in touch with people, give them a window of time. How's your efficiency? How's your workload going? Well, I'll tell you one thing. So uh, in the initial <laughs> transition from, you know, working in a brick and mortar office to now that we're all working remotely, the first couple of months, I've never been busier, never been busier. It, it was literally like, uh, I'm working with people who work across the country. So I'm working in various time zones. Um, and literally it was like from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. I was working. I was just constantly working just because, you know, uh, I, I would, you know, I guess if you were in your own typical office, you, you, you manage your time differently. And I, I guess when people were working at home, you know, everyone's reachable. 
at, at the same, you know, if I'm working in Colorado, I'll probably just deal with the people inside of Colorado and the other people in San Antonio and like people in Ottawa. But once you gone, once we started working completely remotely, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting request supports from Nevada. So it's like, you know, we got a three hour time difference. So, you know, it's four o'clock, like, oh, great. Uh, can you help me out? And I'm like, sure, <laughs> absolutely. You know, so uh, I found that like, um just the first couple of months just getting everyone up to speed making sure that as a firm we were being very efficient you know i, I literally you know i had to like over leverage uh myself but it was very temporary right it was only like the first two three months um but it was it was very busy like uh and i always made myself available and the thing is that if i wasn't it was really quick right? You, you get an IM, you get a quick call, and you can quickly reply, and then you just schedule your time. So, like, you know, it's easy for your schedule to quickly fill up. It was, um, yeah, it's been a ride. Yeah, and, and actually, Lindsay, I'll, I'll extend the question to you as well. I mean, uh, you, how many, how many IPDs, uh, IPD big rooms are you involved with at one point right now? So, right now, actively, it's about eight, and um, I, similar to what Antonio shared, when the pandemic first hit, I was working, you know, from seven until seven at least on the daily. And there was a bit of burnout that happened along the way in the spring, for sure. I'm sure everyone on here can kind of relate because as you made that transition, you know, it almost, it was almost as though the energy we had around the anxiety of not knowing what was going on might have gone into our work, right? So we were probably all channeling that for that reason too. Um, the advantage I've found is I never would have really been able to kind of reach different big rooms on the same day the way I can now. So, you know, normally I'd be kind of traveling and in the bubble of, of the particular big room I was helping out. And now, you know, I can be in Hamilton, right, McMaster, um, you know, for a big room there and then jump into Ottawa and then start moving my way west as the afternoon goes on. So I can end up in Edmonton and Vancouver for some of our others, which has been really cool and it also just from an owner perspective um putting on my former hat it saves so much on travel costs which is uh you know used to be a really big part of IPD and I don't think that we'll ever get fully away from that I think there are definitely certain parts of the, of the startup and along the way um you know pl certain planning conversations or kind of collaboration that is just better in person but we can definitely look at reducing travel costs significantly and i appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> yes I, I but, I mean, it, the 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 other the other thing that that that's nice about you know reducing the the travel is also the environmental side of it too um and we we kind of we talked we talked about you know, saving, uh, switching from paper to more digital um, as part of this, uh, as part of this virtual change. And, you know, that, that, that happens as well. Um, so there, there is, there is very much an environmentally friendly uh, aspect to, uh, to the virtual uh, yes. big room as well. You've actually just reminded me if, if you don't, I can share one of the tools that we get the most feedback on from kind of transition to in-person to this digital setup is uh, what's called a sprint board. So once we're done as a team doing a poll plan, we narrow in and look at what's called a two-week sprint of work. It's kind of, we've kind of built a bit of a mashup between lean principles, scrum, and agile as a framework. And, um, you know, I think people enjoy now that they can take back with them in every other day of their work. Hopefully you can see that, um, this kind of digital sprint board. So each of their tasks from the pull plan would come in here and be dropped into this column, which is kind of a bigger chunk of work, we like to call it. Something that might have a few deliverables that roll up. People can become more granular with that by pulling backwards again to see you know what tasks needed to be complete and then we use what's called a planned percent complete to measure it's also called ppc as an acronym but we're trying to avoid those um, but on that weekly you know kind of two-week sprint cycle we start to measure productivity of our teams and it's a really good indicator that you know before we were only doing as an analog tool with sticky notes and these kind of giant boards in a in a big room and now, you know, Justin can take 
um, what he's committed to do inside one big room and from another big room, plus all the other projects he has on his plate, and he can kind of track them all digitally for himself. So it's definitely, I think, been a, a win. Interesting. You know, yeah, this Liz uh, oh, just yeah. like, I'll just like to add one little thing, sorry. Um, so uh, working with Lindsay, that was my first exposure to actually working with a spread planning board. And I started off with the physical spread planning board. So, you know, as Justin was saying that you commit to a deliverable. So like, you know, every week, I, I, my first day on the job was I needed to make the announcement for my sprint planning. So I'm there and I'm like, okay, I'm just new to the project and I am committing to all these deliverables. Um, moving to the digital version of it, I prefer that way more because I can log on to it digitally whenever I want and I can compare it with the other ones and align it better. So uh, that, that, yeah. that that's I'll here never, to stay. <laughs> I will never miss the post-it notes. I'll tell you that much. I know. Well, and environmentally too, we're really not meaning to waste post-it stickies. It was yeah. it was just what we knew, and now we know mm -hmm. different. So, so it's interesting. So that that sprint planning board of yours, uh, I have a feeling it's actually been pulled from the software industry. It has. Uh, yes. It, okay. Okay. So so yeah, like a system of, like Jira. Exactly. We've also um, I would like. For Shandos, anyhow, our, we try not to prescribe to just one methodology. We try to take the best from what we can and improve. And I would say, you know, Toyota, um, kind of from a lean perspective, has really played a big part in the philosophy, as well as, yeah, the software industry, absolutely. Interesting, because, you know, it, it, like a coding sprint or, or yep. things like that. We yeah. need to do more of that, honestly. As an industry, we we look inside for answers, and it's like we've been doing things the same way forever. And so, uh, we need to look outside of our industry and see that hey, other industries have figured stuff out, and we should just yeah. we should steal. I'm not even going to call it moral. We should steal <laughs> liberally from all these other industries that are making much greater uh, productivity gains than we are. Absolutely. Well, I mean, if you if you look at the if you look at the construction industry in general, um, it's the only industry that if anything has lost productivity over the past, you know, 50 to 100 years, as opposed to every other industry who's who's had gains. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, if you, if you keep looking inside the construction industry, you're just going to get worse and worse. Yeah. Well, and that's where, I mean, <clears throat> in IPD, we, we tend to kind of be able to fast track or at least try to work on bringing that curve um, up for the con construction industry. And it's lean construction too. It's not just integrated project delivery. So I should qualify that. Right. Uh, what about, uh, you know, you're talking about efficiencies and getting efficiencies. Have, have you ever had to be in multiple meetings at once? <laughs> yes, I have had Teams and Zoom open at the same time. I wouldn't say it's the most effective, but, um, you know, it could be perceived as efficient, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, so, you know, like breakout meetings. So maybe maybe even in the same IPD big room, you, yeah. know, you mentioned, you know, having side heckling conversations in the chat. Um, would you open yeah. up the Teams and quickly send a message to someone else? We can. We've We've found that the the most effective big rooms are the ones that kind of automate some of the access for people so that it's kind of at their fingertips. So we always kind of make spaces available. And Antonio, from uh, the project you're on, from the very beginning, I found that, um, you know, Byron and DeVore, um, who kind of helped to set things up behind the scenes, they work to automate a bit of those details yep. so that you could have a quick Teams link to, to access any one of the, the different um, you know, execution teams that were kind of involved in the project. They're called mm -hmm. project implementation teams, but again, avoiding acronyms. They're really just like a cross-disciplinary team that's working on a sprint mm -hmm. of work. And yeah. yeah, what did you think? Did you find that? Uh, yeah, you know what? So I, I think one of the uh, major successes of having a good IPD experience is having a clear structure and organization, right? So yeah. when you're in a room of 100 people, you can't have 100 people talking at the same time or presenting at the same time, right? So um, when we transition to you know the virtual environment, um, that structure was, was still there. So we, we would always start the day with our kickoffs and then we would have our individual pits. I'm gonna keep acronyms. So we had our individual pits and you would jump into your pits and then you would do your sprint planning. 
And then, um, you know, there was that open work section, but, uh, you know, I also jumped from one pit to another pit to another pit. Yeah. Right? If I needed yeah. something uh, to say to the structural team, I would just step out of the BIM, go to structural, go to commissioning, go to mechanical, go to civil, and then like revert back to the, uh, the BIM pit. Or it, that space was always there. So whenever you needed a last minute impromptu meeting, you're like, okay, I'll meet you in the BIM pit. So we go there and it's, and it's open to anyone who's on the project, right? And yeah. that's the idea. So it's like the oh. transparency. It's also the dependability. It kind of sets your mind at ease as well, especially when we're overwhelmed, oh, right? Yeah. We're in this new kind of virtual big room we've not really been a part of anymore. It sets, you know, a little bit of calmness there in, in a, amongst the, the fray. Normalcy. I find it like yeah. a little bit of a normalcy, right? It's like those, those huddles are still there. They're just... Yeah. yeah, the habits are still still mm -hmm. right there, and and you can meet with everyone. Yeah, the so, thing the thing that was nice for me is, <clears throat> you know, anytime that we were discussing something in the big room, since I'm sitting at my computer, somebody had asked for something, and it's just like, oh well, here I'll just send that to you right now, and boom, you know, it it from from the owner side, it makes it makes me look like a hero because I'm getting the information out as soon as it's asked for and you know ultimately the goal of you know uh, the the architects and the engineers and the consultants is to provide value to the project so if i'm not providing them with the information that they need they can't provide me with the value that i'm looking for it's in that that's that's kind of the beauty of the of the ipd process is the fact that everybody is responsible for that value like you gave your secret away i thought you were actually just really good at your job but now i realize that literally anyone could do that if they were at their computer i had no idea it, it's true it's true like <laughs> but they, they they would need to know where to look that's, that's the true. trick that's true. <laughs> Justin, the other day when we were talking about this before you were mentioning one of the things you did wish was that there was a couple more tools available just to support the iteration or you know kind of informal yeah. sketching process you would do in design for sure so i know that this is a conversation that is kind of anchored with bim and so yeah bim 360 is like a pretty amazing uh, uh collaborative tool it's actually it's like once you switch over to 360 from kind of like the original traditional model you're like oh my god i'm never going back but the early portions of design um we don't at least I, I haven't found them yet. We haven't found really great tools for like fast design iteration. Uh, like like something like I'll give you an example. Right, like if you're if you're in an architecture practice or an engineering practice, there'll be a moment where like a group of people are around a table, kind of sketching over top of one another. It might be a detail, it might be an overall concept. But like I can draw something, and then someone else slaps a piece of trace on top of that, and they make a modification. We don't have great tools for that right now. And and that's uh, that's an area that I think is kind of really missing in the digital in the digital paradigm. You, you should can use model. And <laughs> it's 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 okay. <laughs> like, believe me, like I, I've 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 tried them all, but there's like a there's just like a speed that's missing yeah. uh, right now, and we're gonna have to figure that out uh, if we're gonna continue to do this. Because yes, there is a time when everything gets put in uh, to a model. Yeah. But there's a time before that. Uh, There's a couple in the chat don't... here, Justin. Oh, Morfoli really? Morfolio Trace. You might get some leads from this. I have, awesome. I have, I have Morfolio Trace. It's amazing. Thank you, but it's not collaborative. It's that's only for one person. That would be my criticism of that. So, but yes, I'm going to check out all these ideas. Awesome. <laughs> speaking of speaking of questions in the chat, I received a a question from Aaron Corcoran or Corsoran. Sorry if I butchered your last name. I have no excuse. My last name is pretty awesome too. Uh, <laughs> uh, so beyond efficiencies of, of the digital, have there been any surprises or miscommunications and how uh, how they adapted the model of addressing? So maybe, you know, may maybe there were more miscommunications when people were face-to-face -face as opposed to when it was clearly documented in text now that we're virtual. Yeah. Um, so Justin, how about, how about you go first on that? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, because I'm kind of, it's difficult because I'm comparing two experiences which are a little bit different. So the, the CNL room that uh, Antonio and 
and uh, Lindsay were part of was like 10 times the size of the one that uh, Mike had at MIP. So there's a, there's a scale issue there, but yeah, I definitely think in the physical room, there was more, there was more possibility of crossed wires and miscommunications, right? Because when two people are talking, uh, you can hear a little bit what you want to hear. And then you like words are, you know, the, the George R. R. Martin uh, game of Thrones words are wind. Uh, but when you actually make something or you write it down, that that's a much that's something that someone else can like look at think about and kind of react to and so i do think there is there can be fewer miscommunications so i think the formal communication is improved but the informal communication is weaker so there's like a little bit of a trade-off there i think the team building aspects are not as strong but like the 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 technical communications are are, are better i don't know how do you how do you feel about that Lindsay? i think you're you're spot on there. Um, the formal communications were now to Mike's point earlier where we have to kind of pause and listen to each other and, you know, really more deliberately not cross over so we can hear our thoughts in a virtual setting. Um, that part is helping. We still maintain, for example, the technology we did before around Yammer and kind of, you know, keeping a trace of our work and our actions together. So that hasn't hasn't been lost. But it's, we now have to schedule time for informal conversations. That's what I'm finding. And just yesterday on one of the projects I support, um, we had kind of a real come to moment, which was awesome. And it was a bit of a breakthrough, but it's surprising in, in kind of the midst of this year that, you know, the information that was kind of shared and communicated was really about perspective and meaning for this project. And the client just shared a little bit more about their rationalization of some change they were proposing that had been ongoing for eight months. But because we weren't together in a space, you know, consistently week over week, they hadn't thought until now. And they kind of put their hand up and said, oh, we're really sorry we missed kind of informing you on this. But here's some really big picture context that kind of informed the path we're taking with, with change and with design. And everyone clicked and they were thinking, oh, this makes so much sense. I'm so glad that even though it was late that, you know, we spent the time and invested in an hour of everyone's time together to, to just connect on the meaning and kind of the why behind the work we were doing. So, so those pieces need to slow down a little bit more and be more, you know, con conscious for everybody. Interesting. So, so speaking of communication, how, like, uh, I know, Lindsay, you're located in, in Midland, Ontario. Uh, yes. Mike, you're in Paris, Ontario. Justin, I'm not going to mention you because you have super fast internet in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Antonio, you're here in, in, in beautiful, sunny Ottawa with me. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how's the internet handling and like, how, like, you know, for example, there, there are delays inherent with video conferencing. Um, how is, how are you guys handling that? I think everyone's patience has gone up and, um, you know, luckily there shouldn't just be one member on the team that kind of leads the charge, right? Where if someone drops off or if they have to take video off because, you know, my kids will sometimes come in and ask for random things <laughs> or, you know, they'll take my internet down by working on their iPads or whatever it might be. There's someone you can pass the baton to, whether you, you know, you don't even really formally need to say it. The team does kind of collectively pick up and carry on. Um, that's kind of what I've noticed. But yeah, rural, rural internet is a real, it's a real challenge. Yeah, like, <clears throat> I, I, I'm fairly lucky, like, Paris is not that far out in the boonies or anything like that. Um, I, I've got solid internet here. Um, now, that being said, my, my boss, who would sometimes take part in the, uh, in the big room meetings, uh, she really is in a rural area. She lives on a farm. And it, it, it's funny, because when you get one person that that has that uh, has that kind of an internet uh, connection, uh, like you really have to slow everybody down a little bit. Um, so far, you know, knock on wood, everything so far with this uh, virtual environment has been perfect. You know, like nobody's interrupting anybody, at least not intentionally. Uh, <laughs> and, and everything's great, but as soon as you get one person that's slow, they're they're getting that they're getting the last of the sentence, and then they start talking when somebody else has already started in, 
because they already got the end of the sentence. So it, it, you really have to kind of be be cognizant of that. And when you do have somebody on the team that's like that, you, you need to you need to kind of pause in between and give that person the opportunity to uh, to feed into the conversation. So. Um, and actually, one one thing that Lindsay had mentioned about uh, about the the video, um, it, it kind of goes back to one of the conversations we were having earlier. And having the having the virtual environment as a safe space, you know, we we from the beginning we urged people to keep their video on so that we could see each other. And like it, it it's not a physical presence but it does still provide some context. Um, so, like, I mean, I, I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, uh, it but, hugely yeah. affects the culture of the team. I've seen across different teams, the ones that are more engaged by kind of when they can, keeping their video on, are really often the more effective with communication and with even jumping in to solve problems and, you know, kind of quickly move through things in their in their format, but if you can't get a good sense of who you have kind of present in the conversation, right? And video does that, um, you know, that can be a real challenge for a team and they can end up slowing down or revisiting conversation, you know, they mm -hmm. thought they were clear on. Yeah, it's all about that engagement, right? Um, if you know the other people have their video on, you know, you're assuming that they are engaged and they're not in like multiple Zoom or team meetings at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, but you know, you don't want it to happen all the time. <laughs> Actually, Justin, uh, when we previously spoke, you mentioned, you know, there there's there's 80 person meetings where you don't, you can't necessarily have everyone's video on. Uh, Mike, you mentioned, you know, at the start of a meeting, everyone needs to show their face just, just to show that they're present. Um, so, so Justin, uh, perhaps you want to expand a little bit on, on when you have big meetings versus, versus the more inter intimate and interactive ones. Yeah, those are, so the, the big ones are, are pretty tricky. Um, so one of the things that actually Lindsay kind of got us onto early when we made the transition was taking those big meetings and breaking them up into smaller meetings almost immediately and then sort of like flexing back and forth between like big groups and small groups because when only one person can speak and there's 80 people there's like a real possibility that like 40 people are just going to check out uh which which you don't want that's that's not what you want uh, and then the other uh the other thing that i've really learned and i i was going to bring this up earlier so i'm glad you brought this you brought this back around you know there's a lot of different personality types in a big room right? Um, and certain people are more aggressive or forceful and they, they, they want to talk all the time. Um, and I think if you are, if you are one of those people in order to facilitate like a really effective big room, you got to rein yourself in pretty hard. Um, you, you have to kind of remind yourself constantly to like not talk because it's important that you get kind of input from everybody on the team and if you're sucking up all the oxygen it just isn't going to work uh, so that's one thing that certainly uh, you know within our within our projects and within our team we've tried to be very conscious of uh, particularly speaking to some of the people who are more outspoken and saying like just hold fire like hold fire um, or giving behind the scenes like using the chat or whatever to encourage people who are less likely to speak up to, to give their input. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that I think is really, really critical uh, for, those, for those big meetings is you have to be just a little bit more conscious of your own role uh, in those meetings to make them effective. Interesting. I probably see demonstrable examples of that just in this panel alone, since you're all comfortable with virtual meetings and IPD big rooms that you're, you're not necessarily talking over each other. For, for sure, right? And again, I think we're trying, I don't know if everyone kind of does this now, but I leave a lot bigger gaps after the end of uh, when people speaking now than I used to, right? Uh, you know, Lindsay would sort of like finish her sentence and it's like, and I'm in there. Uh, here, here, here's, here's, here's my point. And I think now it's like, it's really important to kind of listen carefully and then just like let what the person said before you breathe to allow that possibility that someone else is going to get in there with 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 some insight um and and realize that 
you know, we're lots of us are probably thinking the same thing. It's so it's not critical that that idea come from you. I think that's another piece that's really important with collaborative design and construction is putting to the side a little bit, and this is probably harder for architects than it is for almost anybody else in, in the industry, put that, that ego to the side just a little bit so that you don't have to have ownership of the idea um, and to kind of share that authorship with the entirety of the group. So I think that's definitely something that we all have to be, we all have to be so cognizant of in this virtual environment. Oh, come on, you're just trying to pass off the liability. There's also that. There's also that. Actually, it was Mike's idea, Your Honor. <laughs> no, he, he's taking credit for not taking credit. It's reverse it's psychology. <laughs> uh, so we're actually coming up to uh, the, the final 20 minutes of this session. It's going great. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I hope you guys are too, as well as the audience. Um, I, I have some more questions, so uh, I guess we'll go into those. So, you know... Everyone here in the room understands understands BIM. Uh, I'm assuming you all understand the concept of the different stages of BIM, you know, stage one, two, and three. How do you see IPD changing when, you know, when, when common data environments, you know, the bit, most, most current example of which would potentially be BIM 360, um, when that really comes into its own, when it starts dealing with the entire life cycle of a project, how do you think IPD big rooms and IPD in general is gonna get adjusted? Mm -hmm. So um, for more of the technical projects we have, like I would say, Antonio, you're working on really the largest in Canada that I've ever seen and a very technical project. So I'm sure, you know, you'll have a unique story to tell around what the process looks like and how kind of intense it is um, on, let's call it more of the, you know, lighter projects in IPD that I've seen BIM has still played such an important part and it really does start um, early in the project with us taking, you know, what would normally be housed just by a BIM coordinator or kind of execution, you know, of a really strong technical BIM lead and it's branched out and reached every partner on the job. So you'll see, you know, everyone on the project kind of invested in getting to know and kind of looking at the lens of BIM to help them in their productivity, in the execution and kind of value add of the work and kind of driving out waste. For example, um, at the start of our design phase, we usually encourage our team to look right at um, the LOD matrix rather than kind of start with a conventional design process of how they would, you know, slowly develop detail in the project. We prefer that they actually start with that BIM execution plan that they would have done early on and work at, you know, understanding and sharing across each partner, you know, I think that we should take this component to this level. I think we should take this component to that level at this stage, right? And then you can start to develop um, within that LOD matrix, it becomes really clear what your milestones are, who's responsible for what component and when they'll have that done by, you know, there's lots of answers in that tool mm -hmm. that can actually help us develop and plan our work in, in design. So that's something we, it's something we still struggle with having everyone adopt, I'll, I'll admit. Some of our, for example, mechanical and electrical leads, they're, they're kind of cautious of getting into the model. Um, until they know that things are kind of locked and, you know, loaded and ready to go. But, but it's definitely something that's improved the execution of the work, being kind of a smarter version of, of doing that. What do you think, Antonio? Maybe I yeah, kind of no, stole your thunder a little there. No, but. <laughs> not at all. I, I, I've got like, I've, I've got a lot of uh, brain clouds uh, uh, working around here. It's um, the, the one thing about like, of having a good foundation with your building execution plan and comparing it with uh, the, the mapping of an LOD matrix. Uh, it gives not only the consultants, designers, but the client an expectation of what they're going to see at various stages of a deliverable. And it clearly highlights when the baton gets passed on from the consultant to the trades and then to facility management and like operations of the facility. So on the project that I'm working on and using 360, it's holistic. Like every aspect of this project from um, 
paper to breaking ground to operations like it, it's all encompassed in this 360 environment so um you know part another thing about my my task is also trying to figure out with commissioning how are you, how is commissioning going to be leveraging 360 for them to do their task as opposed to like a traditional method of you know um, a standalone excel file you know so uh it's a, it's a very exciting time in the industry and especially if you had an opportunity like me to have uh to work on s such a technically complex, diverse project. Um, and there's a lot of possibilities there. You know, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I got a full plate. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Just to maybe build a little bit on what Antonio was talking about, I, I fully agree that the where I see the big gains happening next is integrating non-construction information into the model. Like, it's, it's not to say that we've kind of maxed out what we can do, uh, in terms of the the various design disciplines and their models, but I can see the end a, a, a little bit where it's like we're going to get to a level where our technical proficiency is is, is at a level where okay we've we're are, we're now delivering these like highly coordinated models great tick um, being able to integrate other information that's related to the project but is not you know specifically being modeled like things like commissioning information cost data um, even communications right like that's something that uh, is facilitated now uh, through BIM 360 is that the actual ability to like, to, you know, communicate within the model as opposed to outside of the model. And we're seeing like, that's almost like kind of like a head exploding moment yeah, for us as, as designers. Yeah. It's like, wow, this is way better. Um, so it's, it's not a separate stream of information. It's, it's all integrated. So that's, that's been absolutely huge. And I think that's going to continue to, to kind of change things as we move forward. We have one of our projects that's just about to kick off in January that's going to do just that, Justin. I'm really excited to see how, you know, what differences it makes and, and maybe, you know, they're probably going to have some toe stubs as they start out, but they are planning to use kind of BIM 360 predominantly as like the file sharing communication and collaborative tool. Um, yeah, so it'll be really cool. Fantastic. Mike, do you have, you have something you want to say? When it comes to when it comes to BIM, I I, I leave it to the professionals. <laughs> I uh, I started in drafting uh, using AutoCAD twelve DOS version, so um, I I I am one hundred percent behind uh, behind BIM though. Um, it from from a collaboration point of view and. Uh, and ensuring that you know everything is properly coordinated, the, there's there's no other way to do it than to build the building before it's built. Um, the project the project that I'm working with Justin and Lindsay on it, it's an existing building, um, which makes things a little bit more difficult because it was built back in the 1970s. So, you know, we have existing drawings, but how accurate are they? Um, and because there is so much that has been built within that building right now to try and get a proper 3D scan, it, it's cost prohibitive. Um, so like we really need to get in there and, and, and demo all of the existing walls and everything to, to be able to get a proper model to be able to work from. Um, and and I, I'm excited for that because uh, as soon as we can get that, then we can actually start working on accurate modeling of the building. And, uh, you know, when at the end of it, what I'm kind of hoping that we'll be able to do is take that, uh, take that final building model and tie it into our facilities team and say, okay, here is your virtual building. And now you can do with it whatever you, whatever you please. Um, and, you know, as a, as a project manager that is, you know, likely whatever, 10, 15 years down the road, I'm going to have to make changes to that building. I, it'll be nice to have an as-built model to be able to work from and say, okay, this is where all the pipes are. You don't have to look for anything. This is where they are. Um, to be able to make those future modifications is, it, it's, it's something to look forward to. 
That's so cool. I just, while we're still on the topic, I quickly thought of two other concepts that we're borrowing. We haven't yet seen them fully executed, but I'm excited about them. So I wanted to share just um, for those interested in a bit more on IPD and BIM and how the two really work well together. One of them is that a couple of teams out of the US have decided to fully construct their building in the model first, to your point, Mike. And then, you know, to use that as kind of a conversation point of how to structure the sequence and timing and kind of productivity of the work to really look at collaboration between design development and, you know, how it's going to be executed in the field. So it's really cool to see that because it's um, there's some challenges with it. So I'm sure some of you right away are thinking, right, but what about, you know, the authorities that are going to need, um, you know, a paper set that you're giving as kind of a permit submission. But, you know, those are conversations that are worth having with our authorities having jurisdiction now. So you can start preparing and seeing if they're ready for that. Some are more technologically savvy, which is where you kind of want to start at that early adoption phase. But it's really exciting to think about. And then the other is for our more, you know, kind of traditional designers who might still, you know, really value the thought of kind of detailing something and then drafting it and then packaging it as a set and then submitting it, right? Kind of like more conventional process of work. Um, there's something radical known as kind of thin vertical slices that some design firms in the States are doing where they're kind of only detailing what is deemed enough by the entire project to execute the work rather than just, you know, slicing what they think is every possible condition in, in the model. They're kind of going one at a time and having the whole team, you know, answer the question, okay, now that we've got this developed, is it enough or do we need one more, you know, and kind of just doing enough is, is a really cool kind of lean um, adaptation that, that's coming out in the industry. I feel yeah. attacked. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I was actually one thing I was going to say too is you know earlier we defined what a pull plan was. Mike, you probably should have defined what AutoCAD was. So I'll just do that very briefly for all the students on the call. So back in the before times, uh, before we had uh, BIM, we used to draw on computers with colored lines. And those colored lines weren't actually anything. They just sort of represented other things. And that's how we built buildings. Not sure how- Oh no, hang on though. <laughs> Who here went to like manual drafting? Let's just, <laughs> let's just start there. Yeah. Oh manual man. Manual drafting makes more sense than other guys. That's, that's whole story. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So th this is a pencil. Yeah. You, you, you write on paper with it. Uh... <laughs> If you really want to go, if you really want to go back to uh, drafting tables, actually, I was thinking the other day, my, my kids might have better posture if their computers were on drafting tables instead yeah. of on a couch while they slump over them. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry about the aside. Uh, oh, great. That's hilarious. Uh, good heckling, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I got, a, I got another question from the audience. Uh, it's it's more in line with uh, the, the the people people who are you know have to have to preach to the unconverted about BIM. So so Mike, you said you know BIM's the way to go. I'm assuming everyone here feels the same way. Uh, how do you handle you know the naysayers or or the poo pooers uh, and potentially even in an IPD environment, people who are like, well, I don't want to look at the 3D. Just just tell me what you want. Yeah. I would say we at Shandos, um, we're likely what's considered kind of an early adopter when it comes to this and many other of the concepts we've talked about today. And one of the things we really, we do respect and rely on is data. And, you know, we work with kind of partners in the industry, but also in kind of academic sphere to really help us build kind of solid foundations of data to go on just so we're not, you know, kind of perceived as spouting things that work for every scenario and you must do this, you know, I'm, that's kind of not going to help us get those that might be a bit reluctant. And then you need to kind of seed the early adopters and form coalitions like we do already in IPD, right, to kind of help um, build that adoption to a wider audience. So it's, uh, we've got tons of materials. Um, the IPDA, even though it's not specifically, um, you know, targeted as a, a BIM organization, I would say has lots of great information because IPD is just one of the models that really embraces use of BIM. And, and I think, you know, definitely people who are interested could direct themselves to that kind of organization to help support 
and rationalize to others why why it's such a, a good thing. I, I think from an from an owner's perspective, um, the the biggest the biggest thing that every owner wants is cost savings, and that's what BIM brings um, by getting ahead of the construction. And instead of finding out that, you know, there's some kind of a clash on site, you're finding it out way in advance. Yeah. And now to modify a pipe or to shift a pipe by two inches so that it doesn't hit another pipe or hit another duct, it, all it costs you is five minutes in time as opposed to thousands of dollars on site. Um, that's that's always been my biggest uh, my biggest argument for well why do it in BIM um, cost savings like yeah well it's the certainty as well right so it's not just cost but it's kind of you know also schedule I mean you know BIM can really open eyes around that kind of thing too for scheduling I yeah, quickly or, wanted to share schedule. a. I wanted to share kind of a story. The other thing is like getting more partners that we have in the industry to try it out, right? To just kind of be there alongside them and coach or mentor, or help them, you know, dip their toe in the water. We, um, on one of our IPD projects for CNL, it's called CNL New Builds. Um, Lauren Hall, I'm, I'm not sure if she's actually still on right now, but she was able to share a couple of really great BIM wins from their team. And one of them was, the ability for them to so accurately depict in the model what was going to be executed in the field and kind of the tolerance there was so tight when they were um, constructing their mass timber structure that the cladding partner was able to come along directly behind and not have to wait kind of that extra lag time in production to make sure that the as-built condition was so precise, right? So they gained like weeks and weeks in the schedule and just the confidence of kind of working together to to build that trust for for future work together as well so great. just so many great things fantastic thank you so much uh so we're down to the the last five minutes of our session uh and i have one one last question uh before we we do the closing out so uh let's start with antonio it's the same question for all of you which is if you could if you know harry potter showed up and grant give you magical abilities let's say Dumbledore showed up and gave you magical abilities yeah. you could wave a magic wand uh considering you know IPD big rooms and the current situation with social distancing and you know you've gone virtual and stuff what is one thing that you would want to magically change wow um well, I think this kind of goes with like the major wish list when it comes to like using technology in terms of like designing. I, I really want an all the time heads up display and hands free so that I don't have to rely on a keyboard and a mouse anymore. And I would love to have that integrated type of technology when it comes to a big room so that, you know, like we're, we're decades away from that for in terms of like a cost, like feasibility, but you know, just imagine actually being able to, instead of looking at a screen, you know, you got that AR implementation, you can actually be in a big room and you, you can have like different avatars, but I, I want to take that technology and bring it forward into like, you know, design documentation, um, clash detection, and just kind of always being on board, just being a little bit more, uh, let's say online on those things. Great, great, Lindsay? Uh, I would say uh, it would be the ability to connect on those informal levels more easily in a virtual setting. It's that's the stuff that can feel a bit awkward when you're trying to schedule, you know, but um, and we get we do get a good sense of people in their personal life. Like, you know, I can kind of see behind you, Omar. And if we didn't have our backgrounds on, you would see my space. <laughs> but it's the you know, it's kind of the nonverbal cues, the the energy and vibe that you get from working with people in physical proximity to one another. That's one of the things I just really wish we could magically kind of switch on. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, Mike? Uh, it's hard to say because uh, like my, my experience so far has been phenomenal. Um, the, the team that we had come together was 
outstanding. Um, the amount of work that got done, the efficiency, the value, uh, it's all up there. But I, I think kind of to Antonio's and, and Lindsay's point, it's that it's that let's call it a three dimensional interaction. You know, if I if I could change anything, I'd I'd bring about the uh, I'd bring about the um, technology from Star Wars and you know be able to have holograms and have have people all wearing VR sets and having that having that interaction in literally a virtual space where you can read body language and you can have those side conversations and stuff like that. Um, it, we, we developed a strong team uh, despite COVID and despite the, uh, the virtual setting that we had to do it in. And like, I mean, you know, I, I look at Justin and Lindsay and, I, I, I'm happy to see them again because it, it's like we've become friends through this virtual world. Um, it's it, it's a neat perspective, but it it, it just lacks the it, it it does still lack somewhat of a personal touch to it. Thank you, Mike Juan Kenobi. Um, <laughs> so, Justin, give me the ability to do Morfolio Trace with other people. I demand this technology. <laughs> I demand it. Uh, and then the, the my, I, I'm going to take two because who's stopping me? Uh, and the other one is the ability to better integrate costing information uh, into the model. Like that's missing. That's like a huge gap right now. And uh, I'm I'm working on that. But that's that's my dream. Okay, cost loaded models and more interactive. More more was it Morfolio? Well, th th yeah, the, that's the company and the, the app is Trace. I don't care if it's Morfolio Trace, but an interactive, collaborative design tool for early design. Give it to me, please. Fantastic. Someone, someone design that app and send it to me. I would really appreciate it. I'll pay you money. <laughs> okay, everyone from Algonquin College, go learn how to code an app. <laughs> I'm an architect, though, so not a lot of money. Just, just halfway. <laughs> <laughs> don't kid yourself. You'll just get the free version, right? Of course. <laughs> Okay, Algonquin, make it freemium. Make, make sure he pays. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Free to use, Thanks. but you have to pay to save. Oh, perfect, perfect. These uh. are million dollar ideas right here. Uh, thank you so much again, Antonio Balhosa from American Company, Lindsay Wharton from Chandis Construction, Mike Good, Mike Juan Kenobi from McMaster Innovation Park, Justin Purdue from HDR Architects, and also a special thank you to Algonquin College. Uh, we will be posting the recording to our YouTube channel and we'll send out the link to all who have attended. Uh, please stay tuned to our website for uh, and LinkedIn for future events. Definitely looking forward to 2021. Happy holidays. Please take care of yourself and your loved ones. Really appreciate everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.